Did you call me? I did. Okay, yes. And Mayor Higgins. <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we're just going through the beginning stages. Okay. It's moving too fast. Rolling into it? Well, we have to do a. Move right into the study session for LP Pride Ordinance Office. And we call it to order at 6:35. And can we please plant stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Of course, since they put something in my mouth. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And can we please have a roll call? Certainly. Councilpersons Bear? Here. Dupre? Yeah. Here. Ross? <laughs> Lillian, are you here? I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> Salcedo? Yes. Soar? Yes. Tobin? Yes. And Mayor Higgins? Yes. Thank you. We are here to have a, a study session on the LP Pride Ordinance. Um, and we need to talk about this. And the city manager, if you want to Yeah, so I'm going to just uh, pretty much punt it over. Um, John Myers and, and Joan Gregg have, have put together a, a really nice presentation uh, that they're going to share with you guys tonight. So with further no further ado, Mr. Myers. Mayor and Council, thank you again for the opportunity to share this evening. Uh, as soon as the camera's on, you'll be able to see our slide presentations on board, as well as I've given you a hand copy of each of them as you would prefer. You can take notes on the right-hand side of your documents as we go through. There's about four subjects we want to start with, and from there we will stop after each one for your question and answers until we've gotten through the end of our question. Can you hear? All right. Um, I just want to first, before we get into the list, I just want to thank uh, the City of Lincoln Park Department staffs. They've been very supportive in this transition from LP Pride to code enforcement in the building department. Uh, we've got strong support from <coughs> the Chief of Police and helping us get those cars. <laughs> And uh, we now have two, if you'll notice on outside of the fire department, we have two cars that were ready to go with the support of the DPS. We have gas cards. We also have it tagged and decaled. And, and we have a couple things yet to do in setting up the software inside it uh, once the tablets are ready to go. Uh, the financial department has given us the support. And we've now purchased uh, already two, tick, uh, two uh, Surface Pros. Uh, we've rebuilt those Surface Pros to maximize what we need. We've also purchased two printers for each of the vehicles and phones to go along with those officers for city connections. Um, inside of that, oh, tomorrow morning, we project that the tablets will be um, built in with all the software we need with the IT company. Uh, hopefully, they will also begin to uh, hardwire some locations for the code enforcement long-term opportunity. At least they'll begin to make the adjustments of where they have to take cables and where they have to drop them. So we'll try to do that. Thank you for their support. Uh, HR has been working on the code enforcement uh, um, applications uh, from in-house first, and then if, if there's not enough that come from inside the city's unions, then we'll be prepared to go outside into the city to, to look for other people. We're still looking for, uh, as you know, one uh, office personnel, and then we're looking for two officers to be in the field. Uh, so we've gotten great support. I took a couple of weeks ago now, um, and we borrowed three or four people from the first floor um, to evaluate redesigning the first floor so that we could fit the staff and potential future staff and so we're thankful for those people who were willing to sit and brainstorm uh, pros and cons about how we should do that. Um, we have drawn a schematic or a pencil sketch to code of what we'd like to recommend. As you know, we've now met with uh, Hennessy twice uh, to verify the designs can be met inside the city 
uh, physical structure and without bringing any damage. They have been confirmed, and I believe at this moment the final set of sealed drawings are in the process. Uh, so there's uh, a team that's been getting ready to go to work for us, and we're grateful that they've uh, contributed in all the aspects to get us as close as we can. The target gate date, whether we hit it exactly or not, is when grass starts to grow, and um, that's somewhere in the month of May, early, I'm assuming, uh, unless this year we're fortunate and we don't have any grass growing at all, and then we won't have to be in such a rush. Nevertheless, as we get started, there's five things on your sheet that you we're going to study tonight. Uh, they're going to be a brief review so that everybody's kind of aware of what is the definitions and the values of blight and the effect on the community. We have been invited to take a proactive look at designing a code enforcement program. We'll kind of highlight that for you so you know that it won't be a wait for the phone call to come and that we'll be taking on the, uh, the approach of, of taking a first steps and then going from there. Uh, standard operating procedures, sometimes this is going to get complicated for people who haven't been used to seeing a code enforcement be as aggressive um, in the recent years as they will become in the, co in the coming days. So you might want to think of it in a, a, a movie line. Uh, we're going back to the future when we were very effective of, of taking our inspectors and, and making sure our neighbors and our property lines were clean based on jurisdictions and districts. And we're going to go back to that, and we'll talk a bit about how that, pro, that uh, SOP works uh, in it. And then we want to give you some ideas of the implement, uh, implica uh, implementing it. How do we think we can best uh, so not surprise the city, not um, uh, leave the neighborhood in a shock, and how do we want to begin to educate and promote and develop a strong, positive approach uh, in how we're going to go about it. I believe at the end... Uh, because we've borrowed some of the information and guidelines uh, that the CDBG has, we've brought um, Joan along with me to talk about how that money can be spread out. Um, there is a section that I think will give us a chance to begin to build, rebuild the city in clean and healthy environments. Um, and when we do that, we'll be able to talk about revitalization uh, we think we have one district already that is in that position. We'll confirm that in the next couple of weeks. And then going into the next year, we hope to find two, uh, at least two districts that can be considered revitalization. Joan will give you a detail of what that means to you as a council and what that means to the city and how we finance our way through cleaning up the district. Okay. Uh, is there any questions of any subjects you would like me to add that maybe I did not before I move forward? Very good, thanks. So let's go on just a brief definition of, of what effects uh, of there are of blight. There's five that we just simply wrote. It increases crime. It reduces quality of life for residents. It then increases the municipal need of services, more, more police, more fire, more TPS, more inspections. It then decreases uh, property values. And finally, people get till tired they leave town and call it flight. And so there's the five things that uh, are strongly active in the issues of what happens in blight. I've just given you a few pictures, and I mean a few, of all the types of blight that we're gonna see and many more that will come in the days ahead. Everything from junk in the backyards, everything from roofs on houses where people and animals crawl through to live, and then you can see fences are dilapidated and you'll see garages don't have watertight systems in other parts of the building. In the top right corner, I can't tell you how many violations are in that picture. Uh, I'm suggesting between six and eight, and um, it might just be able to be skipped and go to a dangerous building. But there's the guideline of what we're looking at. Blight was once said that if you take care of the small things, the big things will take care of themselves. You can gain more control over your life by paying closer attention to the small things. And so the building department has taken on the challenge to take a code enforcement and begin to take care of the small things one at a time so that we can restore some of your request according to July's chapter, uh, July uh, 2022, when you invited us to consider cleaning up the business district as objective number one. And objective number two, you've asked us to increase and the cleanliness 
of all of our neighborhoods. And so on those two requests from your council approval and recommendation in July, we have put a program together that maybe you can evaluate, you can watch, and I hope more than anything, you give great support. <coughs> Code enforcement program is going to have two focus points. One's going to be primary, and then one's going to be secondary. And, and I didn't write them by code because there's plenty of them. And by the way, if you didn't notice, on the back of your sheet, there is a document that is two-sided, and it'll give you the 2015 IPMC um, building and property exterior, as well as several of our city ordinances that we'll dominate and use as we address exterior violation, violations of both commercial and building. So part of the guidelines are already in front of you. They aren't all of them. If you don't know yet about the easy reading of the city ordinances, sometimes the subjects in fences are in four different uh, chapters, and we'll be responsible to take care of them when challenges to our ordinance complaints come to us. So here's the five or six things that we're going to look at first. Roofs, garages, porches, windows, stairs and steps. I want to stop at that one a minute. It's not only about steps that are that are there that aren't stable or not are are uh, deteriorating, but we're also talking about the handrails. Anytime, according to the state law, if you have four steps, including the step onto your porch, is four or more, then you're required to have a handrail. That handrail is required for health, life, and safety for the purpose of not only holding on to, but it's supposed to have what they call a trip or a slip uh, protection so that when your foot slides off on the ice, you can't go underneath the handrail. You stop before you fall off the stairs and go underneath them. So when I think of the stairs, you go, why just the stairs? It's not just the stairs, but you can see it'll be handrails and dimensions. The, dimensions, the dimensional issue is simple, in that our bodies are motor trained in most places we go to have a motor memory of a uh, three uh, seven and three quarters to eight and a quarter inches high and so when people try to build their steps and create steps that have anything over three eighths variance between all the steps it gets confusing for people like postal services or delivery package people and then they can't figure out why they stumble and fall and get hurt on your property so those are parts of the code enforcement that are we will take on as eyesore structural issues so let me pause for this minute when I talk about structural issues everything you see here more than likely other than the grass or the vegetation all of those will be more than likely permitted required repairs in other words once the, the code enforcement finds the violation and and identify it and can confirm it uh, that letter will invite that customer or that client or that person or that citizen to go directly to the building department for information of how to get a permit and correct their problem. Because we're starting with what is structurally unsafe, unsound, or unstable. And so there's the primary focus. All of those guidelines and gutters. Someone asked me earlier today, why would I worry about gutters on a roof instead of just the blue tarps? It's because when water comes off the roof and it hits the bottom of the floor, it drains all the way into the ground because it has no runoff away from the foundation. And then if you, well, all of you have lived here long enough to know what happens to basements and foundations in this city when they get too much water at the base, they start moving in when the temperature changes. And then we have foundations that are boy. So the idea of a gutter on a house is to keep the water from away from the foundation so it doesn't change the dimension and the structure and hydraulics of water in the ground. So there's our, our primary direction that we're taking. Our secondary is a little bit more challenging, uh, but we will take it on at the same timeline, uh, just in a rotation of, of secondary issues. Uh, concrete trip hazards, uh, that'll include not sidewalks, but that'll include service walks and driveways. And our standard at the city of Lincoln Park uh, since I have arrived, well, I take it back, since the middle of 2018, we codified here that we would follow the state standards between DPS and ourselves. We would follow the same actual guidelines that the state's asking us to do. So that's how we'll determine what a trip hazard is uh, that causes a difficulty on private property. Please note, we're not talking about public sidewalks, we're talking about private property. Vehicle parking illegally. 
Again, this is not about us taking on traffic parking violations. This is about parking violations. And if you see in the picture beside it, there are two cars that are illegally parked on their property. Uh, if for one of them is because it's inoperable and the other, both of them are because they're not on hard surfaces. So there's the second guideline of what we're talking about when we, when we look at uh, vehicle parking. It's not, we're not taking over the parking violation uh, ordinance department at all. We're talking about recreate, uh, we're talking about property valuations. And the third one that'll come here we can discuss is going to be recreational vehicles. And our ordinance is pretty clear in, I believe it is, 14, uh, 1294. And in that ordinance, it tells us you can't uh, park um, a recreational vehicle within 10 feet of any building, 5 feet of any, any property line. You cannot park it on a hard, without putting it on a hard surface. And you must use that, that vehicle or that recreational vehicle as part of your 40% maximum lot coverage. So those kind of violations going forward are still in what we're talking about as being proactive in cleaning up our neighborhoods. At this point, I'll take a stop and let you ask any questions. Your head might be spinning, but let me see if there's anything I can ask in your study session. I have a question. Yes. Um, so a friend of mine has a rental house, and they keep it up beautifully, and they had an inspection, and their railings going to their, it's a bungalow, the railings going up to the bungalow and down to the basement, they were required to put in wood between the wall and the railing. And they said it's like so a jacket wouldn't be cut, caught on that railing. Well, since that was done about two years ago, she's broken one finger and her husband's broken two fingers. So, and as long as they've lived there, they've had no injuries whatsoever, but they keep injuring them on this part that they were forced to put on the house to keep them safe. Can you explain to me how something that's injuring them now that wasn't there before is a requirement? Fortunately, I don't know them, and I'm not, I, I, I can't explain why they haven't figured out that there's a piece of wood there. <laughs> Um, well, but, they were made to put that wood there by but, the inspector. And I would have supported that wholeheartedly. But let me, com let me comment on two things. It's called a return, and what it does do is it eliminates people from catching their belt, their buckle, their pocket, or their hand, or their sleeve when they put their hand on it, and then they trip and fall down the stairs because they can't get it out. It's one thing to break your hand and move your hand. It's another thing to put a purse on your shoulder, it falls off, catches it, grabs it, it's on your arm, it falls out, and you roll down the stairs. So the state laws in 2012 actually made it a state law in a, in a existing building, which would be the MRB um, division, and it made it a state law that when you have a handrail going on steps more than four inside a building or outside a building, you need what is called a return. I can't explain why they would not do that. The subject is appreciated, but that is an inside building issue, not an exterior. Our code enforcement will never go inside the building at any one point in the future. The only time they will put a return on it is if there's a set of stairs that doesn't have a handle rail on it correctly, and it needs to be put in right, and it will have what they call a return all the way to the wood so that nobody can walk down there and not pay attention, have a bag, have a sleeve, baggy shirt, cotches it on, the, on their sleeve, can't get it out, they strip, fall, and fall down the stairs. So that's why the state mandated it in 2012. Well, it is inside, and like I say, they've got more injuries since it's been there, since it not being there. And it just doesn't make sense to me because I've been in other buildings, like this building doesn't have them. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen them in another building. And I'm just curious as to why they are forced to do that. And they're injuring themselves on it. Any new building that you find today since the age, actually in a commercial building, anything since 2009, you will have found all brand new handrails having, if they're steel, they're rolled, you'll find them turn into the, into the wall. That's been around for commercial and for residential. The only reason this building doesn't is it's older than I am. 
and therefore it has some form of, I didn't have to repair it, we didn't rebuild it, we didn't remodel it, and therefore it's still staying in a grandfather clause. So the, so the building, and building department does enforce this? Oh, yes. In every house that we go into. So when they get hurt, can they build the building department? Absolutely not. But that was a good question. <laughs> I just feel bad because they... <laughs> She's in a cast for six weeks because she broke her finger. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what to tell you. I'll ask. So I asked. I have an answer. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions about how we plan to take a proactive look into these uh, neighborhoods that we're taking on? Okay. Ms. Teresa, Jim, um, there's a scenario in my neighborhood that there's a car parked on rocks <clears throat> that should not be in my opinion. Is that correct? That is correct. So if there's a cement slab, they can park on that? If that cement slab meets the, the standard of not over 40 percent of lot coverage, and if that percent, if that lot, if that parking space meets the li legal rights to having multiple um, driveways on your land. So there's a number of issues that you, we, I can't answer without looking at the property. Oftentimes you might find a corner property being able to have two driveway accesses uh, and, and partial because they have enough wide, wide space. Sometimes a double lot will be over 70 feet and is allowed to have a, a two different locations and still meet the demand. There's a number of variations, but if it's there just because they want to park it there and they have the space, uh, they have to take it off and put hard surface on but when we review the, the permit to get that hard surface, we're going to evaluate does it cover the 40% and does it meet the maximum or minimum of what they're allowed to do for parking in, on their driveway or on, on a driveway. All right? Do, uh, you, if, do the cars need to be licensed and registered? Yes, when that happens, and say they're parked at the edge or in the front of a driveway, we're going to call the, the police department and we'll let them take care of that illegal parking of a, a, a non-operative because they have the, the lien capability to do all that piece of what's going there. And if there they're parking inside their property, on property, then we'll take it as a violation to, to property code violations. Is there an amount of time that an unlicensed, unregistered card is allowed to sit back there? It's probably on the police department and the answer is the faster it gets off, the better. And when, when we haven't been doing this aggressive approach to dividing the system and giving two departments uh, an equal share of time to get to their specialties, uh, we won't really know how fast it will come in the future. Okay, one more thing. If someone is going to um, be doing a rental home, is the landlord required to release information about um, it being in a floodplain? Yes. They are by law required to lease that information. Yes. <coughs> and, and, and probably the reality is most landlords in this city don't know. Yeah. And so when they're asked, they're responsible, and they're the ones legally responsible for in compliance with, with city, state, and federal law. In, in is that things. something that could be put on record on our site? Yeah, we can do that. We could uh, figure out how to put that in, but that's again back to a rental program. But that would be someone is asking about how do I know what I'm doing? But it can be done in in that category. I think it'd be a good idea to let them know that you're responsible for letting your renters know that you're moving into a floodplain. They might change their mind if they know that they could lose all their stuff. Thank you. That's all I have. You're welcome. Anything else? I, I do have a parking question. Is there any difference for parking on your property of a inoperable car that just sits there and a car that is operable and it just, you know, being parked on the grass for whatever event is going on when it's, that evening? When it's parked on the grass and it's caught on the grass, then we have the right to write it for not parking it on a hard surface on their property. And that will not be police. That will be code enforcement. And so that's where that'll get. By the way, it won't take very long to figure out that when we drive by and they go to work and you, they drive that car off of there, it won't be very hard to figure out that there's tire tracks in the grass and to figure out that they do this on a regular basis. And so that'll be our evidence to be able to identify that they're still parking when they think the office is closed and there's no officers out in the field. And we'll be glad to take that photo and challenge that. Okay, thank you.
Through the chair, Your Honor? Yes. Two quick hypotheticals, Mr. Myers. First off, I have a porch, front porch with four steps, right? Yes. I have no, no rails going up. So you come by my house and say you need to replace it. So why do I need a permit? Why can't I go to Lowe's and just buy a rail and install it myself? Because it's a structural safety regulation guide. That structure <coughs> says when you put that handrail up, it has to carry 200 pounds leaning on it. And if you don't have it done by supervision of someone who knows what they're doing, called AKA inspector, then you could do it any way you want, and it may not survive one season. But John, I'm a handyman. I've been doing this for 30 years. Only I don't want to pay for a permit, but I will go to Lowe's and buy the equipment. Then when I'm done, you can you can inspect it. I'm right. I'm our throwing city, this at you. Our city says if you need an inspection from us, you need a permit because we don't do inspections for free. We need to pay the people that work for the city. And so therefore, they need to pull that permit. That, that's part of the problem I'm getting with is why do you have to pay for that? So my next hypothetical is, well, I've been here for 30 years. I'm grandfathered in. Why do I need a handrail? I, when I moved in 30 years ago, I didn't have the handrail. So now I'm grandfathered in, right? I don't have to fix it? You're, that's not true again because now a handrail, and this is, by the way, you guys have the right to, to throw this out the window and say, and I've been in other cities when you're, they're addressing it, saying, we don't want you to bother any handrails. If they're not there, leave them alone. But if you're talking about the first reason we're going at this is for health, life, and safety and the wellness of the community, then why would you want to not put that handrail that's been missing for 30 years for someone to get injured on because they have no way to crawl, get up and down it whenever they're carrying a large packet, can't see the step, it's uneven, don't have a handrail to lean on, and they fall off the edge. So in conclusion, my point is that if I can build a handrail that's structurally sound, why do I have to pay a permit? Come back in two weeks, and if it's not sound, then make me get a permit. Because you made me go out and do an inspection without being paid for it. You want me, as, a, as an employee of the city, to not get paid to do an inspection on a value. If they're going to say that, then let me put up my fence the same way, and you can check it later. Let me do that with my roof, and you can check it later. Let me do that with my windows, and you can check it later. Let me do that with my sewer line, you can check it later. And pretty soon, we might as well not have a code enforcement because you're in worse condition than you are present. Thank you for your answers, Mr. Myers. I just want to make sure the citizens are aware of what we're doing here. Very Thank good. you. All right, anything else on that topic? Through the chair? <laughs> if I could ask, Mr. Myers, I see on here where an uh, officer will print out a standard letter and leave it, right? But are we still in question as to how much time we're going to allow for the correction? Let me, if, let you save that question till we get through the next subject. Thank I you. actually turned the screen okay. on earlier and we were, the first topic was here's where our codes are, here's how we're taking them, here's how we're re registering them. This is going to be our standard operating procedures and when some officer goes in the field, they will do a site inspection. When they find a violation, their first responsibility is put in, in records. They'll record it in our BSNA. And once they did it there, they have to do that by state law and by regulation under my guidelines. They will have to put that violation in under a IPMC or city code number. They can't just say, I don't like you and I hate your color of your paint, so you're going to have to paint it again. They have to have identified why we've made a violation. Our letters then uh, will be designed for the intent of having a standardized statement, and those will be variable. Typically, because we're going for structural and our city is not used to it, our, my recommendation is all of our standardized letters for any structural violations is going to be 14 days to make contact with the building department. Because as I said earlier, the first thing is that this is the warning notice. You need to figure out what the city's codes are if you don't know what they are for putting up that step or that handrail again. So we're giving you two weeks to go and pay, make a phone call and say, hey, I got this notice on my door and now I have to do this. But if you notice in the years that we've been doing vegetation and snow removal, there are four different letters. And some are as quickly as seven days, some are 30, and some are just two. Because when snow, if you give them 30 days to remove <laughs> snow in Michigan, you're missing the point. And so the injuries on the sidewalk doesn't help. So each of those will have some variation. But on our structurals, we're going to recommend 14 days because if we give them 30 and they never get back to us, then we have to start phase two and go, hey, we've, you haven't come to us. We're going to cite you as, with a, a civil infraction. And now we're 
watch this, we're, we push this thing out potentially three months before they get now into court, and then from that they're going, now it's winter, I can't do anything, let's wait till next year. So we want to be expediting all the issues as quickly as possible can. There's the proactive approach. We want to see as quickly as you can to pay attention to what we're concerned about. And so on that note, we want to give them a deadline that is shorter than longer. If we have to get them to extension, they can do that when they say, I can't do this this month, but I can put this on the table. And we're going to say, good, give us the contractor if that's what you need. And we'll put the bills together and move forward. Some of these will be, oh, I called the police bar, but I don't have any money. And they're going to say, good, you're going to go to the CBG. You're going to find out if you can afford and if you're in the district and you can be used. By the way, you don't have to guess. If we, our code enforcers, give them a letter from the CBG at the time we give them a the letter of their violation and it's hanging on their house, it's because that officer already knows they're inside the CDBG district. Okay? And therefore, we can expedite them already going to Joan's office and getting all the information they might need to get the information to start paying for a, re a renovation project on their house. Okay? Does that help? So there's the guideline that we're going to put. You can see it's not, it's not rocket science. We're just... Excuse me, we're just going to follow our notice of, of warning, if you want to call it that, is that first letter when we post it on their house. We will give them time to get to the city, get a chance to ask what's going on, what do they have to do. When the code enforcement gets it into the, to the house, it leaves their hand until they respond to the building department. If, the, if they don't get any response in the building department for permits, then it'll come off, watch this, the, pr the pr uh, progress check will be automated not to the building department, but back to the code enforcer. And they will make sure that it doesn't fall through the cracks. So if in 14 days, they look and go, what's on my address again, I need to follow up on this, they're going to find out on BSNA if anybody came in, because they would know it from the BSNA connection to the building department. So they're going to get the follow up down the road. So when they don't follow up and they have to write the ticket, that, that ticket response from the court will also come back to the code enforcement. And the only time it leaves the code enforcement is when the building department gets the rights and the process of making a permit. When they do, then it's in the hands of the building department and no longer in the code enforcement. And that's the, that's the uh, SOP that we're using going forward. Before I go any further, is there any questions on this subject? Through the chair. If I may. So with, with that scenario, as a uh, council president was suggesting that if someone's a handyman, they can pull their own permit, right? If they're, the, if they're the resident? Thank you. If they are the resident occupant of the house. Okay. If they own the house but it's a rental, they cannot. So if, if they're eligible for CDBG, can they... Can they do the repairs themselves themselves no they have to go through a contractor right. okay okay great question anything else going once here's the implement, implement implementation what we want to do is several things to put here and i'm going to borrow joan here to explain some of the opportunities that we have but first of all what we want to do is create a, a brochure and it's going to be a package system that we already have for certificate of occupancy. How do you go from nothing to a business and get the whole package? We gave you a sketch drawing on your paperwork, but we literally want to put it in an animated picture that says you're going to have, here's the things that you can know that we're going to come and look at your house for structural issues. From sidewalks to roofs to windows to doors to porches it's all going to be added and then we're going to give you our code that says why we're allowed to come and do that in that three color fold then everybody that has the knowledge that needs to have it will have availability whether it's handed out at every office when they walk in the door and says i don't know and they go oh, don't tell me here's just the file if they have to go to the city hall at the city manager's office they can say the same thing if they come to ours they can say the same thing however we'd like to recommend that we do something that we did with landlords a couple of years ago, and that is to expedite the issue by going into each neighborhood, selecting them by starting with with our CDBG district, which is all gray on the board that you see in front of you, and then visiting and inviting them to come to a public forum. We'll get to talk, explain, 
give them question and answer time without specifics, just hypotheticals, and then we'll be allowed to go from there to giving them a document that they all can have. We recommend that we're going to have it done both in two languages and bilingual, both in English and Spanish, so that form doesn't have to be questioned or read by somebody else because they can't read it. It'll be done in this city in two languages, and we'll put it in a format so that it'll be distributed in that hearing. When we do those, I would be, it would be my recommendation, we'll talk about this at the end of the meeting, that we'd like at least two council members to be present so that they can see how we handle ourselves, how we handle our business, how we handle the customers, how we handle our communities. And then when they want to ask some elected official where they stand, you'll already be there to hear <coughs> what we said, and you'll be able to respond at the same point. So when you see this protocol of, of implementing, rolling it out to the community, we want a document. We would like to get into each neighborhood for a forum. And what we're trying to do is take a strong, aggressive attack to the CDBG. There's money available for all the gray areas. And we're going to talk a little bit later. You see it at the very bottom. We now know there's, we're going to finish the creative research on what is called a neighborhood revitalization strategy. It's in other cities. Ours is qualified for it. We think we have one right now. Can't confirm it. Don't say I did it. I said we think we have one. And that district right now follows Lafayette to Southfield back through Fort Street. We think that is our first district that allows us to use that, regu that regulation. If it does, Joan will give you an explanation of where that expands our CBG money opportunities and therefore we get to be re aggressive. It also, if we target that first and those early, then it also gives us more resources to address infill land building into those neighborhoods. So we want to pursue them so that we can take first steps, code enforcement, in difficult neighborhoods, getting rid of the gray, increasing the population, increasing city values, increasing lot values, and then we want to infill. And if we can get through that red line on that screen, then we have the opportunity. So let me share it with you, Joan, to come and explain what the funding situation might look like and what she might be asking for us to do. Good evening. Um, I get that the biggest thing that I want to talk to you guys about later today um, or later this evening, our budget, the CDBG budget is um, on the docket to, for you guys to approve. And outlined in that, we have money uh, line item for code enforcement and also for blight remediation. And that's really where this funding, um, where this funding is coming from for the coming year. So what we're hoping to do is focus our attention to um, what we're, we're deeming neighborhood one and really have our, our blight funding go to homes in this area um, for income qualified uh, residents within the area. And then from there, um, the reason why I put provide pre-qualified contractors, right now for one of our homeowners to go through the process to have any rehabilitation done to their home, it runs anywhere from six weeks to possibly up to two and a half months. And that's due to the bidding requirements, um, and then waiting for council to approve resolutions for for them to have the funding. So what I'm proposing is that we what that you guys allow me to bid out every year um, qualified contractors to pre-bid these specific projects on a per square foot price or something like that. So we already have pricing in place and we have a rotating pool of contractors that we can, once we are able to approve somebody through our process, whether or not they're income eligible, we're able to then just connect them with the appropriate contractor to get the work done and then just have the um, resolution come to you guys to let you know that yes, this resident is using this funding and like we do any other um, uh, a rehabilitation program, so that piece would still be there. So you'd still have oversight as to you know what's going on within, but we would have this pool of contractors pre-approved, I guess, to get this work done in a more expedient manner, um, and to help us maintain um, a contracting price that doesn't fluctuate. 
right? We, we don't have, but right now we have a, I think it's around $107,000 that we earmarked for blight remediation in the coming budget. Um, if you think about it, that, that might be able to help anywhere from seven to 10 homeowners on various projects. So if we're going through the bidding process, what I've seen out of my office is what we anticipate something to be is four times what we've been expecting it to be. So I'm hoping that in being able to get a pool of contractors to pre-bid and, and have you guys pre-authorize these specific contractors, I'm hoping that we'll be able to get the most bang for our buck with the money and, and help as many, many homeowners as possible with the little bit of funding that we do have available to us. Um, at some time from 2000, um, at some time after 2000 was when this area was designated a neighborhood re revitalization strategy area. If we, if that is still in place with HUD, I don't know if there was an uh, expiration date on that or not. But if it is still in, uh, if it is still available to us, that will help us with being able to help all homeowners in the area, not just income qualified homeowners. So that oh, would be nice. very, very nice um, for us to be able to do. So we're hoping, we're researching whether or not we can. Uh, reactivate that area and whether or not we can add more. So that's on the table later. Hopefully we'll have good news to bring to you guys later. But yeah, so we're hoping that if we can focus our funding here, it will help. We'll be able to have really clear, tangible um, I'm blanking on the word. Result? Thank you. Thank you. Who helps with the funding and with the blood program? Any questions? Bill, the chair, your honor, please. Sure. First off, I love implementation and rolling out to the community. I like that. However, under the code, enforce, code enforcement program, what if my neighbor's got three tires laying next to his garage and four trash bags and six wood pallets? Does he call this number and say, hey, there's some blight? Or yeah, is so it an anonymous? Or you're going to say, he, well, my he, neighbor snitched on you that you got to clean this up, blah, blah, blah. How do we handle a situation an like that? There will be an extension in the city system that they'll be able to call directly to the code enforcement line, and they can handle that and, and, and process it. Different than in the past, we're not taking and starting with whoever calls us. We're taking an aggressive action, as you can see, and we're going to go through districts and neighborhoods. In fact, we have already have a projected idea of how we're going to divide the city in half. So the first year, whichever officer is on one side of the, of the city, and the other officers on the other, we've divided it based on, on struggling neighborhoods as well as less struggling neighborhoods, as you can see in the map. And then any addresses and phone calls that come through as a blank <coughs> call, it'll go to that individual for that side of the street that they, they operate on. Okay, so my follow-up is, Mr. Myers, so the neighbor's been contacted, you got tires, wood pallets, and trash bags, you have two weeks to clean it up, but you don't need to have a contract to get it out, or you don't need a no. permit to get it out, just clean it up, no right? No permit for that one. All right, thank you. Perfect. <laughs> no permit for that one. Thank you. And, 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 and the rollout, you're gonna, is this going to be in the happenings edition, or is this going to be a yeah. rollout? Yeah, it'll be in the happening editions, I think, if, if they allow us. They may not let us. I don't know. By the way, we like the phrase. I think it's qualifying. It's putting the responsibility back in society, back into the community. If you notice our flyer, it's not complete. It's not even designed yet in, in its full measure. But a quality neighborhood starts with you, and it's not starts with us. We're the regulators. We're not the ones that can keep it that way. We're, we shouldn't be the ones helping the kid to keep his, clean, his room clean. He should do it himself. But if we can treat that and create people with the goal that it's their responsibility to bring their neighborhood back to life, then we think we're doing a positive uh, in that direction. All right. Is there any other questions you might have on that subject before we go on to the last category? Uh, to, to the chair? Sure. I was wondering, what about all those calls you get from neighbors complaining about structures illegally made, et cetera, et cetera? What happens if you go out there and you don't find a problem? Do you still anticipate getting angry calls from people that you don't find a problem 
about? Absolutely. <clears throat> There's a Hatfield McCoy philosophy in the city all the time. Somebody doesn't like their neighbor and <clears throat> want to find a way to get even with them. And so we're going to have to regulate that. What scares them is when they really argue and give us all the reason why we should go check it, and then we call them back two days later and go, hey, there's no violations according to state, city, or law, or ordinances, and so we're not moving forward. And they go, uh, yeah, sorry, you have to find another way to get even with your neighbors because you can't use this regulatory. They start throwing stuff over the fences. Huh? I, I had a question for Joan. <clears throat> Uh, how many months did you say if the, you had to use the CBD funding? If I had to use you, if, if a person needed to use the funding, how many months would no, it take? I was saying that the current process right now would be there would be a resolution for going out to bid, a resolution for right. awarding the bid, a resolution for awarding the funding. So those pro that process could take anywhere from six weeks to two and a half months. Got it. Right. So in order to mitigate, in order to help lessen that timeline and have a faster impact within the community. Thank you. It also would reduce, in my opinion, your work on the on council for taking care of all her resolutions. If over the next first, in the first six to nine months, uh, we are, are fast tracked in our training and our learning and our efficiency, then her office is going to be overwhelmed with a lot more requests for revenue. And if that's the case, and it came, everyone has to come to you, you're going to be overwhelmed every time there's a, a list of things to be done and it, it just gets backed up. But the goal would be to be both proactive in how we're addressing the city and how we're doing the implementation. We're going to educate, we're going to support, and then we're going to act. And if we can do those three things in that order, then we can also probably eliminate as many complaints because they don't ever see anybody out there doing the job, even though they have been for years successfully doing the phone call returns. So we're going to do the phone call returns in a, t a shorter time manner, but we won't be there. Guarantee you called me today, I'll be out this afternoon. It may not be that. It'll be when that person within five business days has the time to lock in that address and find out what's going on. The only time we'll take it on an immediate is if there's a sense of urgency or a sense of health, life, and safety, and somebody's life is in risk, and we get that periodically ourselves. So is there any other questions on that subject as we go forward on this study session? Move on. So here's our action plan. We're asking you to consider helping us. We're really going to need your support going forward. We're going to need you to believe in what we're doing and that we're following your ordinances and your state guides in uh, 2015 high PMC. And if you do, then you have the right to watch us, but we need your support when all people in the world don't want this kind of pressure. They like the idea of leaving half of the yards messy, sloppy, and out of order. And so we're going to need your help. And one of the things we're asking you to do is figure out if you can give us approval for the, gen the contractors to be a designed and planned. If you haven't figured it out already, you know it's been done with our contract with cement. We do that in that system. We also do it in fire and, and police and the building department in emergency board ups. We have three companies that we can use. We call them according to who's available and who can come take care of the job for us. And so we have already have it in some form of precedent to do that. This was just uniquely done because we think we can expedite the process of money process of contracting, process of completions, uh, without having to interrupt. If you need us to give you a report every quarter to see what the numbers look like, we'll be glad to do that. But expediting this and moving this process through a healthy, clean, uh, revitalized neighborhood strategy is what we're trying to produce. So we'd like you to consider taking a look at how we can, you can grant that if it has to be in, a, in another meeting that you have to officially make that a motion. If you need us to make that a resolution for you, let us know. We'll be glad to do that. But as we move forward, we'd love you to be able to give us that kind of support. We'd love to see your support in our in our uh, public forums so that they can ask you and you can defend if we're making up a story in the middle of it and you've heard something else. Uh, and then I think we can write our, our formats, our color schemes, and our portfolios so that people everywhere in the city doesn't have to wait on looking at the web page to figure out what's the new rules and it's who's playing in the new game. So we'd love to have your support in, in building out the code enforcement office. There's a situation right now that if we start in May, we have to train our staff 
we have to figure out where we're going to put them. And so uh, we have put a preliminary guide. We don't have a set of drawings from the city um, at engineers yet, but if we could find a way to take that in pieces, that would be helpful. If you'd be willing to figure out how you could recommend giving us that right to do that in bites, smaller than the entire list of all of the projects that was designed on designing it, we could help. The first one we really need is to find a way to put a hole in the wall between the building department and the next room once that office is cleared. And then to do that, we need to clear spaces of all the security you issues. Wall, holes in wall? That the clerk is required by law to have under, under lock and key. We'd like to move that to the garage, build a wall, build three secure doors, and then she has everything she needs to satisfy all the secure issues for the state inside security. And then the rest of the first floor is free for us to design as we will. If we can take her stuff and get it out of the, out of an unsecure place, and we can knock a hole in the wall between us and the office that needs to be vacated or something needs to be done to it, then we could move forward more expeditiously. The other one would be to pass a resolution to let the CDBG office uh, take bids on annual blight uh, companies so we can put more contractors on the table and move them a little more quicker. That's all I have for this study session. Is there any other final questions? John? I'd be glad to give it to somebody else to answer. Can you, can you please tell us where and when you need us and how we can... Of course, we'd be delighted to tell you when we're having a public forum and, and what location. And if you can um, give us a tour of what you have in mind, because I know some of us have seen it, some of us hasn't, and maybe we can help brainstorm. I'd be glad to, and, and if you had it after the after the service, the, after the event this evening, I'd be glad to walk you through the building while you're here. But um, more than likely, we are in contact, contact with the public school systems, and they have been generous to us and offers any of their buildings at any time that we need them in an evening if we're going to use them for a public location in a, in a district neighborhood. We have at least three churches that have also done the same thing, so I think we have enough locations that we can put based on the support of the city manager and, and CBG and where we can put these things and what kind of timelines and so that we can get the most out of that meeting. I'm going to assume that each one that we put together will take more than one meeting because once they find out it's real and they get questions answered and they get guidelines written, they're going to go home and talk and they're going to want another meeting and more people. Once that meeting gets to the maximum and say it's 50 people and all of a sudden it starts whirling down to 20, we won't have any more because everything we could have communicated has been done so. And we can get to introduce the city to a proactive code enforcement development. Thank, Thank you. you very much. John, can I ask you and Joan to get together with James and give me resolutions what you want and so that we can be ready to move? Yes, sir. Okay. Through the chair, if I could also ask um, in your pamphlet, I don't know if, if the CDBG map would be too big to put in, but we need that somewhere too so that a lot of residents understand that they're in those areas as well. That's a good idea. We'll see what we can do to put it on which side of that page in that document. But if I could add if to... Not, just oh. to let you know, William, any time a, a code enforcement officer gives a, a violation in any gray area, uh, automatically a letter would be attached from our office. I know, he's, yeah. So, um, so that would help them. Right, know right. In that area. But hopefully people, people may not know right now that they're in those areas, you know? Oh, and sure. this, is, this is honestly the first time when Mr. Meyer says gray area, mm -hmm. that it's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Thank you very much. May I turn it back to you? Okay. Well, with that, I'll make a motion to to end this. And so moved. Okay, we don't, so have, to, we don't have to. We don't have to have a motion. We're just going to adjourn this. Okay. And uh, we're going to give everybody five minutes to go to the regular meeting. Okay. We'll give Maureen six minutes. <laughs>